extraordinary, going beyond what is usual, regular or established. We believe extraordinary prayers can lead to an extraordinary life because we serve an extraordinary God. What if we truly embraced the discipline and delight of extraordinary prayer? What if it led to personal breakthroughs? What if it led to a new chapter for your family? What if it led to a new sense of God's presence when we gather together corporately? What if it led to a revival in the fulfillment of our 2030 vision? What if our extraordinary God is simply waiting to respond to our extraordinary prayers? Don't settle for ordinary when an extraordinary life awaits those who embrace the power of extraordinary prayer. Well, hey, Calvary, so glad to be jumping back into our series, focusing on adding extra to our ordinary when it comes to our prayer life. I don't know about you, but as we're more than halfway through this prayer experience, I I have felt and I have seen God speak and move in both small and and big ways. This has been such a sweet season for for me personally, for my family collectively. And and here's our hope for you. We we hope the same thing is true for you. As as we lean in to the word of God, the ways of God, and listening for the voice of God, I mean I hope that in small and in big ways you have experienced extra to your ordinary when it comes to your journey of communing with God, being found in prayer. So today we're, we're diving into the next uh, installment of this series, and we're focusing on a discipline that, that might be, if we're honest, a little bit more difficult to implement when it comes to prayer. And the topic is, is this, if you're, if you're type A, it's travailing prayer. It's me and God, and I'm desperately seeking his face, his, his voice, and ultimately his right hand upon us. It's, it's praying without ceasing, as Paul says in the New Testament. It's a long yearning that's deep and wide. It's a desire to see God move on behalf of people. It's travailing before him in prayer. I was reminded this week of a guy named John Wesley. You probably have uh, have heard of him if you studied any amount of church history. Now, in the uh, late 1700s, John Wesley, prior to starting what we now know as the United Methodist Movement, was a person of travailing prayer. And it was said of him that if you looked beside his bedside, you would see actual grooves in the hardwood floor from his knees being planted and rooted, travailing in prayer before his heavenly father. What was he praying for? He he was praying for, and he didn't even know it at the time, for you and for me. He was praying for those who didn't yet know and follow Jesus. He was praying for lost souls, for hurting families. He was praying that lives and legacies will be knit back together by the grace of God, by God's right hand, upon them. He was praying for people he had never met and will never meet. And and Wesley, for days and for years, found himself in the rhythm of praying long through the night, asking God, God, would you move? Would you do it again? Would you move on behalf of your people? And what birthed out of nights, sometimes all night long, of travailing before his heavenly Father, was a movement where thousands upon thousands of people put their faith, their hope, their trust, their lives in the hands of Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Now, I look at guys like John Wesley and and I couldn't help but personally reflect, oh Lord, is this anything like like me? Like, am I anything like him? Am, am I travailing well before you? And, and if I'm honest, and maybe if you're honest as well, if for me, the answer is not really. Uh, I, this is an area where I long to grow in. This is an area where I want to grow deep and wide. I want to seek the face of my Heavenly Father on behalf of other people. I, I want to be the voice that leads to the great revival, not because of my talent or, or my face or time on a stage, but because of my time in prayer. God, would you do it again? Would you move on behalf of your people? Man, what if it was said about us as a movement that, man, those are the people with the grooves in the floorboards 
Those were the people that spent hours upon hours, days upon days, and, and years upon years just seeking the face of their Heavenly Father. As we look back into the scriptures, even back into the Old Testament, we, we see a ton of examples set before us of what it looks like, what it feels like to travail before the Lord in prayer. And, and one of the, the writers, a prophet, found in the Old Testament is, is an amazing example of what this looks like. And maybe you've not studied this part of the Bible, or maybe you've not looked at it for some time in a long time, but, but his name was Habakkuk. And Habakkuk is a, a minor prophet, and, and not to mean that he's any lesser, but simply that his work or what was recorded about him is, is very short. In fact, this is really the only time in the text that we see his name or his life or his ministry mentioned. It's very short. It's only three chapters, but chapters one through three from beginning to end is this story of a prophet who's not speaking to a nation in this instance, but in this instance, he's speaking directly to God. He's travailing. Now, what I love about the book of Habakkuk is, is this. Habakkuk looks out over his, his people, right? And he sees nothing but destruction coming upon them. See, at this point in time, the Assyrians, if you've read the book of Nahum, for example, another minor prophet, you've, you've interacted with this people group. They weren't good. In fact, they were full of evil. They were full of destruction, and they wanted nothing more than to destroy God's people. And Habakkuk looks over his people group, and, and he sees nothing but destruction. The Assyrians were causing havoc. They were causing grief, and, and nothing good seemed to be happening. And Habakkuk, for days and months and years, cried out to God, God, would you intervene in our behalf? God, if you're good, would you just step in and would you do it again? Habakkuk said in chapter 3 that I've heard of your good works. I've heard that you're good. Would, would you step in and would you intervene? He's travailing on behalf of others. He's travailing. He's praying. He's asking the Lord. Lord, would you step in and would you show your good right hand upon us once again? Would you deliver us, set us free, and offer us mercy? And so Habakkuk journeys through this life of travailing prayer. And, and if you start in chapter 1 and chapter 2, here's what you're going to notice. This is a lot of complaining. Like, he's travailing, he's asking, but it's kind of bookended by, Lord, if you're good, show yourself to be good. It doesn't look like you're good. Lord, I heard that you can set people free. I heard that you're just. It doesn't seem to me like you're very just. Man, maybe for you and for me, this has been our experience when it comes to travailing prayer. Just the context of the book of Habakkuk alone maybe encapsulates for some of us what it meant or what it looks like to travail before the Lord in prayer. It's a lot of God. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're speaking. I, don't, I can't hear your voice anymore. I heard that you're good. I wish you would show up for me and my family. I heard that you provide. I really wish you'd provide for me in this moment. And here's what I want you to know from the beginning before we dive into our key text. That's okay. Like your doubts, your complaints even, your questions for God is, is nothing that he can't handle. Habakkuk, a prophet of the Lord, wrestled. He, he sought the face of the Lord. He questioned God. He questioned God's goodness. I mean, when it comes to your doubts and your wrestlings as we journey with Jesus, here's what I want to submit before you. I mean, I, I think we grow in the tension of the unknown. Just like Habakkuk, he didn't know how God was going to move, but he was asking God to move. He had a lot of questions about how God could possibly step in and set his people free. He had doubts. He, he didn't think that God maybe, maybe would even do it in the way that he expected. But he continued to travail. And in the tension of the unknown, in the tension of the questions, God showed himself faithful to Habakkuk. And he answered his prayer. And we get to chapter 3. We get to the sweet moment where Habakkuk has wrestled and questioned and doubted. And we get to a moment where 
where he kind of comes up for air and Habakkuk is recognizing and realizing and remembering that God is eternally good. God is eternally faithful. God is always good. Even if we don't see how he's at work, he's always working. And in travail, Habakkuk prays these words back to the Father. This is what he says in chapter 3, verse 2. He says, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. This is a sweet moment that is just a breath of fresh air for Habakkuk as he looks into the face of his heavenly father. And in a moment, he's leaving behind his questions and his doubts and his wrestling and in in awe. He's saying, God, I remember you. I remember your good works. Would you do them again? And so here's the first thing we can pull from just this simple text, this simple prayer from the minor prophet. It's, It's this, travailing in prayer, begins with an awe of God. Ultimately, if we're going to travail well, ask well, seek well the face of our Heavenly Father, we need to be in awe of the face of the one that we're seeking. We need to be in awe, in worship, be driven to our knees by the one that has created us, that has formed us, that is holding all things at all times together. See, Habakkuk, in this moment, he, he said these words, and these words were penned. He said, I have heard of your deeds, and I stand in awe of your deeds. Here's what I think, at least for me. I, I think my lack of travail in prayer it, it stems from a lack of awe of who God is. I, I simply forget who I'm speaking to. I forget his nature. I forget his character. And and practically, I forget what he's done. See, for Habakkuk, he was in awe of God's deeds. What rekindled the fire in his heart that was troubled was remembering how God has moved in the past and the promise of how God will move again in the future. He was in awe of what the Lord has done and what he's capable of doing. Have you, have, have I, and have we... Have we lost our awe? Have we forgotten who he is, what he can do, what he has done, and what he promises for us in the future? Man, I think if if we've lost that, a simple step to rekindle that is just pressing pause for a moment. And, And I would encourage you, maybe in this moment, pause in some way and just remember the good and great deeds that he has done for you. Man, Paul Tripp, in his book simply titled Awe, man, he said this about us. He said, I or we were wired for an awe of God. No other awe satisfies the soul. No other awe can give my heart the peace, the rest, or the security that it seeks. And it's so true. Like at the soul level, we were hardwired and designed to be in absolute awe and wonder of our Heavenly Father. Like if you think about it or look around you for just a moment, everything that was created was created by Him. Everything in you and around you is always being held together by His hand upon us. If you breathe in for a moment, that breath is a breath as, as from God. It's a gift of His grace your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors, your employment, his provision, whatever it may be, it's, it's a gift of his grace to you. Whether common or, or whether supernatural, his grace, his hand is always upon us. If I look back on my life, if you look back on, our, on your life, how has God moved? If you think simply about your salvation story, that is miraculous and eternally shaping. Something like me that was dead in my sin, that wanted nothing to do with Jesus, is now alive in him because of what he has done, not what I have done. Like your life and my life, as it's being shaped by the Spirit of God, as you're taking steps in obedience to God, I mean, it's all a gift of his grace. 
That should drive us to our knees. Here's, here's what I know. When a heart that has become numb to the awe of God it is typically not a heart that is seeking the face of God. If you want to travail in prayer well, rekindle the awe of who he is in your soul. Man, he is God and we are not. He's a father that loves you and is for you. He's always with you. He's gone before you. He'll give you everything that you need for life and godliness, for today and for eternity. If you're saved, if you're a follower of him, for eternity we get to enjoy him. We get to be with him. We get to worship him. That drives us to our knees. I'm in awe of who he is. What has he done for you? What's he done for your family? I was driving to the office to record this today in the back of our minivan. I had a moment with my three-year-old where he looks out the window and he said, Dad, guess what? I was like, what, buddy? He's like, God created all of this. I was like, yeah, absolutely. And I looked around, I turned behind me for a minute And a small tear was forming in his eye. It was starting to fall down his face. And I thought he was upset for a moment. And I said, buddy, what's wrong? Is there something the matter? And he said, no, it's just so cool. It's a moment of awe. God made this. God made me. God loves me. God has saved me. God's at work within me. The overflow of awe leads to a life that travails in prayer. Have you lost your awe? And if so, man, take a moment. Remember the deeds of God. Habakkuk said, I'm in awe of your deeds. I'm in awe of your fame. And then he goes on and he says this, repeat them in our time. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy In plain language, Habakkuk is saying, Lord, would you do it again? Now, remember the context of this book. The the prophet was looking out over his city. He sees his people suffering. And through much travail and wrestling and questions and doubts, he's arguing with the Lord. He's praying before the Lord. He's complaining before the Lord. And he has a moment where he remembers back to the goodness of the Lord. He's in awe of who he is. And he says, oh, that's who you are. That's what you've done. Would you do it again? Would you do it again in our day? In your wrath, remember your mercy And here's what we get to do as people of prayer. This prayer of Habakkuk can be our prayer for your life, for your city, for your neighborhood, for your university, for your high school, for your middle school, for your family. This can be our prayer. God, would you move once again? All the great revivals that we heard of in the past, would you do it here and now? God, over my university, over my city, God, would you stir the hearts of your people to go and make disciples? God, would you show your good hand upon us one more time? Would you show us mercy when we deserve wrath? Would you give us grace when we deserve nothing? God, would you do it again? I think about every community that Calvary has a location I think about State College and Penns Valley and Lewistown and Tyrone and and what's yet to come. God, would you do it again? God, where there's addiction and brokenness, would you restore it? Would you put broken things back together? God, those who are lost, who are far from you, would you bring them into the fold of God? Would you show your right hand upon us? Would you save? Would you restore? Would you set free? You're more than able. I'm in awe of your deeds. Would you do it again? Our staff in a a couple weeks, we're going to be surrounding Penn State University just because that's where our central office happens to be. And we're going to be praying this prayer. God, would you do it again? If you're watching this at one of our locations right now and you're leaving the building after service, as you're in your car, as you're driving through your town, through your city, would you simply pray, God, would, would you do it again? Would you do it again for my family? God, my my kiddos have gone astray. My grandkids have gone astray, but it's not beyond you. You love them more than I ever could. God, would you do it again? Now, Habakkuk 
praise these words. He's travailing before his father. And what follows in the rest of chapter 3 is an incredible poem about the majesty of God, about the sovereignty of God, about the goodness of God. And what we see from that is as we travail in prayer, we're in awe of who he is. When we ask big things of him, we can simply sit in remembrance that God is God and we are not, and he loves people more than we ever could. And so we rest in his sovereignty. We rest in his majesty. And we simply allow our hearts to be postured as one of of worshipers. And so for you and, and for me and for us, man, as we pray the prayer of Habakkuk, God, I'm in awe of you. I've seen your deeds. Would you do it again? What's the do it again part for you? What are you praying? God, would you move on their behalf? God, would you intervene on their behalf? Would you show yourself mighty on their behalf? Uh, for me, I've got people in my family that, that don't know Jesus. Uh, they're far from God. And, and the cry of my heart is that, God, would you do it again? God, would you reach them where they're at? Would you speak to them where they're at? Because you're able God, if you can bring nations back to you, you can bring a few people back to you. God, nothing is beyond your control. Would you show your goodness to them? Would you do it again? Now, here's what we get to do. As we close, we get to practice travailing together. So whoever you're travailing for, we get to practice the God will you do it again prayer. And so here's what I encourage you to do. Between you and the Lord, would you take a moment? Would you bow your head? If you need to open your scriptures or even just open your hands, let's start in the place of awe. Lord, I remember your deeds. I remember who you are. And God, on behalf of my children, my city, my neighborhood, my workplace, God, would you do it again? Let me pray for you. And this week, Man, I I encourage you, as we travail in prayer, look for the right hand of God upon you. Let's pray. So Jesus, we thank you, God, for who you are and what you have done and what you're capable of. It's, It's eternal and sovereign and magnificent and uncontainable. That's who you are. And so God, we've seen your deeds. We've seen your salvation. We've seen your grace and mercy. Would you do it again? God, over our cities, over our workplaces, over our universities, over our families, would you do it again? Would you save those who are lost? Would you provide in magnificent ways? God, for the addicted, for the marginalized, for those who are experiencing injustice, would you do it again? Would you show your grace, your mercy to us? God, you are able and we're completely dependent upon you. So God, do it again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.